What is up, Scrub fam? Pat here, and today I want to talk about the Series 10 trailer that dropped on Friday. I wanted to do it then because a lot of people were blowing up my inbox on Facebook and Discord asking for my opinions on things, and I was sick, so I didn't really have any way to get around uh, to doing it. So yeah, uh, sorry about that, guys. So here is my attempt to try to answer some of your questions and hit on some specific things from the Series 10 trailer that I personally want to talk about. Uh, before I get into that, though, I want to give a shout-out to my other sick brother from my other mother, uh, Alec Pastrana, <laughs> over at BeardedCollectibles.com. He's the sponsor here at 3XG Productions. Dropbox 5 is coming out within the this month, I believe. It's like somewhere like three to four months. Um, and looking at the spoilers, we haven't seen everything yet, but the super rares seem like, once again, they're going to be very meta-defining, so you definitely want to pick up sealed product from Alec. He's going to give you the best prices, so you will be able to buy more boxes. Your buy, your box will go even further to try and buy more boxes to get those chase cards, because if this is anything like Draftbox 4, you're going to need to buy as many sealed products as possible. So, yeah, again, check out Bearded for everything. So let us jump right into it. The right, first thing I want to talk about is the product lineup for 2020 that was shown off. Um, a lot of people were complaining that, look, uh, seeing this slide, they were complaining that uh, there's still too many products. Product fatigue is a real thing. There are too many products per year coming out for Dragon Ball Super Card Game. They really wish they didn't have to buy so many products. They have too many starter decks, too many expansion packs, too many draft buy, uh, packs, things like that. And what I wanted to do is dispel that myth. I think that Dragon Ball Super is still one of the most affordable. I don't know if it's the most affordable card game on the market to play, but it is definitely one of the cheaper ones, especially when you compare it to the big three. So we are getting four booster box releases this year, along with three starter decks. It looks like there are no other starter decks. It is just going to be these three starter decks that are starting with Series 10, as well as two expansion uh, sets and two holiday gift boxes and two draft boxes. Um, that's what it's looking like, um, and then obviously in the anniversary box, so that is overall something to the tune of two supplemental sets, two, four main sets, three starter decks, a holiday gift box, and like three expansion products. So when you compare that to, you know, Magic the Gathering, which is the obviously the most popular trading card game in the world, we can see that their booster box sets are from last year, 2019. They had core set 2020 in quarter three, Ramnica Allegiance in quarter one, War of the Spark in quarter two, and Throne of Eldraine in the tail end of quarter three and going into quarter four. So, what does this mean? They have four sets, just like we do. They also have a supplementary set, Modern Horizons, which is for a different format uh, that is then the standard competitive format, but most of the cards can be used in competitive. They are not used in standard, but they are able to be used in modern, legacy, vintage, and it is meant to be drafted. So for that purpose, I guess you could say it's similar to our draft boxes, but not quite the same. It's not functionally the same. Um, important to note, the four booster boxes have roughly the same amount of mythic rares, that is magic super rares, as our bo uh, uh, boxes do of Dragon Ball Super card game. Our MSRP per box is $79.99. Wizards does not have an MSRP due to some weird relationship thing with Amazon. You can guys can go Google it. It's some really weird stuff going on there. But for the most part, most boxes are between $99.99 MSRP or US, uh, USD MSRP or the high end is $119.99 USD. So that is still between $20 and $40 more expensive than a box of Dragon Ball Super Card Game, and I feel like you get more out of a Dragon Ball Super Card Game box than you do out of a Magic the Gathering booster box. Then you consider Modern Horizons, which we discussed about earlier. That is a $220, $230 USD MSRP booster box. That's insane. I know Acid is meant for, uh, the power level is much higher in it, so they're commanding a higher MSRP, but the point I'm trying to tell you guys is that the booster boxes are of the same value, if not better, for much cheaper than a box of Magic the Gathering. And then you look at a, a supplemental product like Commander 2019, that is a deck that uh, is meant for a commander, a casual four player format, but it does have chase cards that competitive players want, and those retail for $39.99 uh, USD as the MSRP. And then you look at Signature Spellbook Gideon, which is very similar to our Surge Coup and Surge Piccolo expansion packs, and that has a 1999 MSRP with the same kind of cards 
like seven to nine cards just like in our surge packs with, without booster packs that come with it so when you consider the 1699 to 1799 msrp on the surge plus the booster packs it's a much better deal uh there's also the fact that there are planeswalker decks um and starter decks and dual decks and things like that that are available for you know in addition to all of this it'd be too much to put on one slide but there what i'm trying to basically get at is that bandai has kind of copied you know wizards business model most people seem to because it's the one that's successful it's the one that stood the test of time and they are cheaper at it and they have less products than wizards overall when you consider all the planeswalker decks and things like that and the holiday boxes and the starter intro player gift boxes and things like that so yeah much cheaper still looking at the other things uh yugioh i don't pretend to play yugioh i'm going to assume that these legendary duelists and speed duels are supplemental products but if you do that then you're looking at somewhere between the realm of i'd say it's six to eight regular booster pack releases uh per year for yugioh and then we're looking at again somewhere around like you know another four to six in supplemental products that is still a lot more than Dragon Ball Super card game, and I believe, I don't know the MSRP on Yu-Gi-Oh, but I'm going to assume it's very, it's either similar or more expensive than Dragon Ball Super card game. And then you have to uh, figure in things like starter decks, structure decks, uh, tournament packs, reprints, uh, box sets, tins, things like that. And you realize that there is probably a lot more for Yu-Gi-Oh as well. Speaking of uh, tins and things like that, Pokemon. So obviously I crossed out the things that are in 2020 or 2018. So you look at Cosmic Eclipse, Hidden Fates, Unified Minds, Unbroken Bonds, Detected Pikachu, and Team Up 6. Again, six core sets came out for Pokemon in 2019. That's still more than our four. And if you factor in our draft boxes, then we are still at parity with these guys. We are six each. Um, and then also, I'm sure everyone knows, like, going into your local game store or Toys R Us or, you know, wherever you shop, there's definitely those, like, gigantic blister packs with all the promos and the alt arts. And then they have the tins, the elite trainer boxes and things like that. And you start to see, like, they have a lot more supplemental products than we do as well. Um, and some sets can only be acquired in supplemental products. So I don't think, again, Dragon Ball Super is that bad. When it comes to this, I've seen people say they wish there was only one draft box, one starter deck, and two booster box uh, releases per year. And that's simply not sustainable. Bandai is a business. They are simply mimicking their competitors and at the same time trying to be cheaper uh, and offer better value to you guys, the players, I feel, than some of these other games. Um, I know a lot of people who are playing Dragon Ball Super are, this is their first competitive card game, and so it seems like it's expensive, but that's because trading card games are expensive. The booster pack model is designed to make as much money off of you guys as possible. That is the whole point. They're trying to get you sucked in so that you can buy more booster packs. So yeah, again, that's that's just the flaw with the model, and it's business as usual. So. Uh, no hard feelings, but I kind of wanted to just dispel that rumor that this game is not affordable. This is, I think, the, uh, using this model, one of the most, if not the most affordable game for it. So, let's move on to talking about deck size construction uh, limits. So, they have kept the minimum the same as 50 in Series 10 and increased the maximum to 60. So, let's talk about variance. Variance is the thing that makes card games different than other competitive mediums such as video games. There is skill involved, yes, but because of the randomization of the deck, no two games play out the same. It's almost impossible for every game to play out exactly the same because of the number of combinations and orders you can draw decks for between both players. As a competitive player, you're trying to get every game to play out exactly the same. If possible, you're trying to reduce variance and increase consistency in your deck. It is the cornerstone of trying to build competitive decks and playing to win. Uh, you want to just do something very powerful, very quickly, very consistently. So when you see this, you could jam extra cards for more stuff. That seems cool, right? But what it does is it in decreases the consistency at which you can win the game. So now let's say you need to draw Height of Mastery Sun Goku to win the game. And there are 28 cards in your deck, uh, then your odds of pulling the card is what four and 28 if you have four in the deck uh, assuming we let's say we have perfect knowledge of our life we don't we know it's not in our life so like if you had added 10 extra cards and started with the 60 card deck then your odds of pulling the card are four in 38 so 
uh, you can start to see that it's harder to draw it, using the same example if you could go less than 50 cards I'm sure almost every person would tell you that their their deck would just be like four one drop swaps four uh, you know three to four two drop swaps four path to greatness uh, four height of mastery one ultra instinct Sun Goku the awakened power um, and then maybe like a couple of cards to try and get sparking they, they, the whole package would be like 18 to 20 cards people would only play this 18 to 20 card deck because it does the same thing every single time very very consistently by adding more cards you are drawing the cards that are not the ones you need to win the game or the ones you need at the exact moment so there's literally no reason whatsoever to ever try to play more than 50 cards except for one of the two scenarios one you're playing this jerk wad yeah th this jerk wad um so if you're playing set two zamasu then i think that having 10 extra cards aka two extra life um, is probably worth it because uh, at that point he's milling so many of his cards anyway that he's not going to see um, the right ones that he needs all the time it's already an inherent drawback to the leader so might as well just take the extra two life right like who, who wouldn't want two life like if you could play a 10 life leader I, I'm pretty sure almost everybody would unanimously say yes I'll take that so Zamasu is one of the only ones I can think of the only other thing I can think of and I'm still waiting to hear from a ruling on Bandai or see it in an FAQ or something like that is can I present a deck between games one and two and two and three that is not the same deck size configuration as what I presented at the start of the match so what do I mean by that can I take 10 cards out of my sideboard and just throw them into my main board you know in between games two and three uh, or one and two uh, just to make it so that it's harder for my Janimba slash cooler player to win the game via mill that's pretty much the only other scenario I could think of where you'd actually want to do this and I think the way that other card games haven't ruled it is yes you can do this but again I'm not really sure I don't know how Bandai is going to rule it so there you go pretty much the only two reasons to ever go up to 51 or more cards if you were playing 51 cards I, I, don't, I don't know man like just just play 50 it, it just just play 50 and so lastly let's talk about unison cards so unison cards are the quote-unquote planeswalkers that we've been hearing about for like the last like month or two via leaked rumors and things like that so before I even talk about these cards let's first talk about planeswalkers what are they so planeswalkers is a card type that was introduced in the set Lorwyn uh, back in the mid to late 2000s in Magic the Gathering it is a new card type for lore reasons you as a player when you play magic the gathering are a planeswalker you are a powerful wizard that plane walks to different planes different multiverses you know you could be an earth you know on in this dimension and then crossover planes walk to another dimension to visit another realm that is the whole point you are this powerful wizard that can cross the multiverse and cast any number of spells so that's what you are when you play magic the gathering the planeswalker card is supposed to be another player that you summon to help you to help aid you on the battlefield to defeat the other enemy wizard that is sitting across from you that is the whole lore and flavor purpose of what planeswalkers are they are not creatures which creatures are similar to battle cards in our game so you will summon one of these cards for its cost in the top right hand corner and they come into play with loyalty on the bottom right Oop, my bad so yeah they come into play with this loyalty on the bottom right here uh, the the, this one, for example, Liliana Vest starts with five loyalty. Loyalty is like your life, uh, but it is not for the Planeswalker. So these Planeswalkers are basically immortal, but they have a certain loyalty that keeps them under your control. When their loyalty becomes zero or less, they become disinterested in the fight and they Planeswalk away and no longer wish to help you anymore. That's supposed to be how it works lore-wise. So every turn, there are three abilities on a, a Planeswalker, and you can choose one of them. And, for example, using Liliana Vest, you can give her plus one loyalty to get this effect. So, target player discards a card. Minus two, search your deck for a card. Then shuffle your deck and put that card on top of it. So, she goes from five to three loyalty if you use this ability. And then she has minus eight, which you can't use when you start with a starting loyalty of five. So, you would have to use this plus one ability uh, and keep her alive for three or four turns to be able to use this minus eight, which is put all of your battle cards in all drop areas into play under your control. That would be the what is considered the ultimate. It is the ability that usually wins the game if you keep. It's the payoff for trying to play the planeswalker to keep the planeswalker alive. 
If you keep it long, live enough, you get this ultimate, this really game-breaking effect that tries to win automatically. So that is the basic overview of what Planeswalkers do. So now let's look at Unison cards, and we start to see that they look similar, but I think they are a completely different card type. So for starters, if we look back at the lower one five here, uh, you'll notice that almost all of the lower one five have four or five costs, except for this guy, Jace Bellerin, who costs three. Um, usually Planeswalkers cost four. On average, three ones are usually pretty pushed. Um, what I mean by pushed is that they are usually like way over the top. Usually the cheaper the Planeswalker, the more ridiculous it is. That's not always the case. You look at a card like Tybalt, for example, at a cost of two. It's not very good, but usually the cheaper it is, the more likely it is to break the format. The more expensive, the less likely it is to break the format unless its abilities are absolutely game-breaking. So again, looking at these unison cars, they cost X. So that's already uh, a big departure, I think, from the Planeswalker. But then you also see they have these, these pips. So I, this is red, red, X. So I'm assuming this is a minimum of two. So already we're looking at unison cards. They are just straight up cheaper, like a lot cheaper than Planeswalkers. Um, and that says that they're probably going to be ridiculously powerful um, in the current metagame. I don't know. They, they have power also. They're not, they don't have loyalty. They have power. Um, so I'm going to assume that they, they leave like Planeswalkers when they run out of markers. I don't really know how many they mark the markers they lose, like because it looks like they're they're very similar to leaders. They have 15 power, so I don't know if you can just attack them and then they just die in one shot. Do you do attack them and they lose one marker, two markers, 12 markers? So it's very difficult to figure out what they do, just from the limited information that we have from reading on the Facebook group and the video itself, but. Um, the fact that they have power means that they probably can attack, especially when you look at this Vegeta over here. He has activate main battle. Choose one of your opponent's energies, switch to rest mode, and this card gets plus 5k power, double strike, and dual attack for the turn. So it looks like it actually is another leader that you are playing, and it has these abilities um, where you get to use one of these like plus or minus abilities each turn. Um, the big head scratcher is when you have a card like this that says activate main. Once per turn, choose this card or one of your battle cards and switch to rest mode to add a marker to this card. Is this independent of these abilities, this minus one, minus three? Does this count? Is this like a plus zero ability? Does this count as one of these? Can I use this activate main and this minus one? There's a lot of things to digest here, but um, overall, they look like really powerful cards because these are reusable effects. And if they're not easy to get off the board, which... Planeswalkers and Magic traditionally are very difficult to get off the board um, outside of targeted removal or burn spells, which we don't have burn spells in this game. So, uh, like Catastrophic Blow, you can't redirect it at a Unison card as far as I know. So, again, the big question is how do we get these cards off the board? Because uh, if they stay around long enough, anybody who has ever played competitive Magic will tell you Planeswalkers dominate the game when left unchecked to the point where the entire game warps around them. They are incredible incredibly powerful card types that need to be answered and on top of that when they are not balanced properly we just evolve into gener de to degeneracy um anyone who has ever at least had a passing interest in competitive magic or has played it no doubt knows who the boogeyman is jace the mind sculptor the, you guys have probably seen this card before uh this is or at least was the most powerful planeswalker ever printed and he is good you can just read his abilities and tell that this card is very good but it is not immediately obvious that this card is straight busted so for example it has plus two you get the top card of a player's deck and put that card on top of the, its owner's deck or on the bottom then you have pay zero draw three cards and then put two cards from your hand on top of your deck in any order minus one bounces any battle card back to its owner's hand and then minus 12 is you rfg your opponent's deck from the game um, and then you they shuffle their hand and put it on top of their deck in a random order So they basically lose their hand and their hand because their what was their hand becomes their deck So that last ability obviously seems crazy But you'll never get it when it's minus 12 and you start at 3 life and you can't really go up any higher than that The main thing about the Jace is that he has this ability that will make it so your opponent only dead draws That's the main reason why Jace the Mind Sculptor is ridiculous and it's not immediately obvious And we are going into a new card type with these unison cards where it's not immediately obvious if these cards are you know weak good or pushed because it's a new card type this is the first time we've seen these in the game in a game and traditionally when you look at like say Yu-Gi-Oh uh, Legend of Blue Eyes a lot of the, the 
the spell cards in that set are really busted. If you look at Magic with Alpha, a lot of the artifacts in the set are really busted because the designers don't quite have a grasp on what is or is not broken with this new system. So that is where a lot of my fear comes from with these card types is because um, they have they are very easily capable of taking over the entire game and being very difficult to deal with. A lot of people are very um, upset with, say, the counterplay meta that we have now. Well, that feels like it's by design because in set seven they introduced a lot of counterplay, same with set eight and things like that. So now we're in this very counter heavy, counterplay heavy focused meta that revolves around all the new cards from the series seven and eight. So you want to buy series seven, series eight cards because those are the things that are going to be strong and competitive against the previous strategy. So now we're going to have these unison cards, which, you know, I don't know how they're going to rule it, but I'm going to assume that they you probably can't use counterplays in response to them. So these are going to be the ways to start beating out those decks that are just playing a bunch of counters. You're going to probably be able to just play these unisons, have them stick around. And if your opponent's going to play a purely reactive counterplay strategy, which is what if people try and do that versus planeswalkers, they just tend to get dunked on. And again, I have to say, and caution, I just don't know how strong these are. And to give you another example, we'll use Oko Thief of Crowns from Throne of Eldraine, which is, you know, only been out for like five or six months at this point, this card. Um, Oko Thief of Crowns is the most broken Planeswalker ever printed. So to look at him, he has three cost, uh, really cheap to play, comes into play with four life, which is higher than the JSA show. He comes into play, he comes into play with three loyalty, this Oko comes into play with four. And I feel like this card perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about when I say we just don't know how strong they are. So you look at his first ability, plus two, create a food token. What the hell is a food token, right? It doesn't matter. I'm telling you this is the most broken card, you know, in the uh, the archetype or the, con the card type ever, and it makes a food token. It almost doesn't really matter what it does. Uh, that, that's the whole point. The designers, the play testers, the players, when they played, when they first played Oko Thief of Crowns or read Oko Thief of Crowns, they were like, makes a food token, whatever. But then you start looking at these other abilities, plus one makes an artifact or creature lose all abilities and become a 3-3 elk until end of turn. So you start to think like, oh, it's removal, but like it, ha it can come back to hurt me. Like I can turn, uh, you know, a big 5-5 five five into a 3-3, three three, but it's still there, it can still kill me. Or I can turn a problematic utility 1-1 one one into a 3-3 three three, and it's like, oh, well, I gave him a 3-3, three three, he can still kill me. But you can use it on your own stuff, including food tokens. So you can make your food tokens into 3-3 three three creatures out of nowhere. You can turn useless things into 3-3 three three tokens out of nowhere. And then he has this minus 5, he can basically gain control. Uh, give You give your opponent either one of your artifacts or creatures and gain control of one your component uh, opponent controls that costs 3 or less. So you're basically swapping things. So you can give them something useless. Uh, and you can get something useful in return. You can give them like you know an elk or whatever have you, um, and like that's not like this game-breaking ultimate like the Jace. The Jace basically removes your opponent's deck from the game. They just lose on the spot because they no longer have any answers. This is not that kind of thing, but it's super cheap and it's super reusable on a guy that starts with high loyalty and gets a lot of pluses with his ability to create food tokens and then also the plus one to make elk. Um, so he's just super efficient at doing everything, and it wasn't immediately obvious again to Wizards of the Coast, their playtesting team, the player base at large, but once you start to realize the things you can do with Oko Thief of Crowns, because these are reusable, repeatable effects on hard-to-remove bodies, that you start to realize that Planeswalkers are, when they're not balanced properly or they're not tested for every scenario, they can just be straight busted and completely warp the game. So yeah, um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Um, to give you an example of some really well-designed Planeswalkers when it's done correctly, uh, on the left we have Chandra Torch of Defiance, which is probably my favorite or second favorite Planeswalker ever printed. This is just a generic good stuff Planeswalker that does something that's really, you know, that's good, but not necessarily powerful in a color that normally needs it. Red is a color that does not get ramp, and red is a color that does not get card draw. So having two plus ones on the Chandra, one that gives you card draw, that also can serve as a backup win condition for an aggro deck is great. And then you have the plus one to give her two red mana to your mana pool. Again, red never gets ramp. So this is really so cool because it gives red options and we get to do cool things that it never usually gets to do. And it's just a really nice, uh, fun card to add to the top end of your curve. It's not necessarily overshadowing the finishers or any of the other cards in the deck. It's just a nice utility card to put in the deck. And then obviously has a little bit of removal and a game-winning ultimate. 
you know, just to kind of make it, you know, push it a bit to make sure that it sees play. Uh, it's just a really good card, and it's a lot of fun to play um, in most decks, and it'll just slot in really well. It's not necessarily busted, um, but it's still just a good card, and you'd be happy to play it, um, but it's not necessarily a thing that you need. It's not like a staple and the archetype. There are things that you could play instead of it. And then you look at Soren Imperious Bloodlord. This is uh, the Planeswalker that's based around vampires as an archetype. And this is the kind of card that pulls a whole deck type together. Like I could see a unison card built around Namekians. So you have like a unison card that's like a Piccolo and he gives your Namekians critical and like 10k or like he lets you, you know, discard one of your Namekians to like, you know, KO two of your opponent's battle cards, ignoring barrier or something like that. And it's just a really powerful card that rewards you for playing a specific strategy. And that is welcome um, because it's not just something you can throw in every deck. And it's like it, it's seen as like you worked for it, right? You you went all in. You made sure that your whole deck was Namekians to be able to play this specific unison card because you know that it's just that ridiculous. And in that case, it's seen as more fair when a card is like straight busted or really pushed when it is locked to a specific strategy or archetype, and you basically have to play only that specific archetype. So. Again, these are examples of when you do Planeswalkers correctly, um, and I, I think that eventually they will probably try to make unison cards that are more like this. Again, I don't know if they're functionally the same as Planeswalkers, because again, they've got the X cost, and they've got the, the power. Um, speaking of the X cost, it's kind of a little alarming because this minus ability, normally Planeswalkers are based or balanced around the fact that you can't just ulti them immediately. Um, these cards... So this card you could just pay for and immediately just get a, uh, I guess this looks like a pseudo uh, Fearless Pan effect. So you could basically just pay for, for Fearless Pan. You won't get the body, but that's still pretty nice, right? Um, same thing with this Vegeta. You can just pay uh, pay for to just get a 15k, or I should say 20k double strike dual attacker, uh, as well as switching uh, a battle card to rest mode here, I guess, and get another marker. So yeah, um, overall looks like a pretty solid you know addition to the game i'm really curious to see how it plays out again when handled incorrectly i think it's just really strong there are just other ways you can address it too um hero's downfall is a a over costed removal spell compared to traditional removal for example on magic and it gets rid of planeswalkers as another mode on the card think of a card like slumber strike imagine if slumber strike was like ko something that costs more than your opponent's energy or choose a unison card and ko it so I'm assuming that they will make cards like Heroes Downfall in case as like a backup plan. If unison cards are too strong, then they can kind of fall back on this design space to kind of get rid of them. Overall, as much as I, I come off as doom and gloom in this video, um, Planeswalkers have given me some of the most memorable and most fun gameplay experiences I've ever had in trading card games. And even though unison cards do not seem like they're functionally the same, they're close-ish, right? Close enough where... I am feeling pretty optimistic about them and I really can't wait to get my hands on them and play them because they're just really fun. Again, just just if they, they if these are as I'm imagining them, if they are when I get them and I get to start playing with them and seeing how they actually function and work with all the cards in the card pool, it's going to be a lot of fun and honestly, I can't wait. I think that series 10 is probably going to mark another um, milestone in in this game like to the point where uh, it's just it's going to get crazy, y'all. That's basically what I'm trying to say. We're going to have way more deck possibilities than you guys think. Like, we're already getting to a point where, like, yeah, there's, like, 10 to 14 competitive leaders. We're going to – the sky's the limit. Like, especially if they, like, lock some of these. Like I said with the, the Namekian example. Like, imagine if they have unison cards that are locked to specific leaders. Then, um, yeah, it's going to get real not so like, real fast, guys. Um, so that's been it. Those are my impressions. Again, sorry it's kind of long and rambly, but – yeah, this is a big a big deal. These are this is a big new card type, and uh, again, hopefully it's awesome. Speaking of awesome, hopefully your day is awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, guys. My name has been Pat. Smash the like button, sub if you're new here, and as always, if you're looking to level up your game, Patreon link down in the description below. Bye bye.